world is a prison because he's done extensive preaching in prisons all over the world. And in this prison that we're all in, that we call the material world. So before we start on that, I'd like to read a brief introduction for Maharaj. Maharaj was born in New Jersey, USA in 1947 and came in contact with the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, ISKCON, in Denver, Colorado at the age of 24. In 1973, he began practicing Krishna Consciousness in New York City. More than 50 years, 51 years of devotional service. Very nice, Maharaj. In 1973, he began practicing Krishna Consciousness in New York City and shortly thereafter began serving in the New Vrindavan Farm community in West Virginia. He received initiation in 1973 from His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. In 1986, he accepted the sannyas order and began preaching in Cincinnati and Columbus, Ohio. In the early 1990s, he became involved with the ISKCON prison ministries in America and began visiting inmates, holding programs, along with writing letters to inmates and sending in Srila Prabhupada's books. In 1995, he began serving as the resident sannyasi in Chicago, where he is based today. At present, Chandramali Maharaj preaches in America, India, Western Europe, Slovenia, Croatia, Italy, and the UK. He is an initiating spiritual master within the in the in ISKCON society. Welcome, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Is there anything else you'd like to say? This is a very summary uh, description of your glories and, and contribution to ISKCON. Is there anything else that you can add to that? <laughs> Hare Krishna. I think that's really too much. <laughs> anyway, yeah, as far as, um, yeah, there's been one, two books that we had had compiled and authored um, based on preaching in prisons. One is called Holy Jail, which was the first one. And this is a copy of the book. And it's a, it's a summary of all of the preaching prison, prison preachings that we had done around the years. And then we put it all in the form of a book. It's about <coughs> The devotees who were who were in prison about inmates writing their realizations on on Krishna consciousness on Srila Prabhupada on their experiences of becoming a, a devotee in jail and many of the accounts of the of the programs that were held in prisons and then we did a second book which came out about six years later this was called Forbidden Voices. And this book um, is really focused on the inmates itself, their letters, their realizations, their artwork. Um, there's a whole, let me say, in-jail culture that is centered around Krishna consciousness in different places throughout the world. And many of them are very active in uh, writing, reading Prabhupada's books, and also spreading uh, Krishna consciousness to their fellow inmates also. Where, where will we find these books, Maharaj? Where are they available? He, they're, they're, they're available through Congregational Development Ministry here in, uh, in Mayapur. Um, you can, they have their office here, in, I think, in the Long Building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but anyone who contacts me personally, I can also uh, give them a book. I, ha I keep a supply also. Maybe you can share your email address? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can share your email address? Yeah, right now? Yeah. Okay. There's, it's a very simple email address. There's two of them. You can choose either one of them. It's uh, my name, Chandramali, C-A-N-D-R-A-M-A-U-L-I, 586, this is, these are numbers, 586, at gmail.com. Uh, that's the oldest one, and then I developed a new email address within the last year, and that one is Braj, B R A J, C M S at gmail dot com. So I, I respond on either one of them, so you can, like that. And I've also done another book on a different topic called Krishna's Way: Natural Living, Farm Community, Self Sufficient. 
of Srila Prabhupada's vision for developing our society uh, on Vanashram Dharma. So that's, that's a more recent book that, just re that came out. And it contains a lot of Srila Prabhupada's statements about, mm, about simple living farm communities and uh, the reasons why behind it and the importance of it. <laughs> Was that based on your experience at New Vrindavan? Uh, no, it's something I got inspired by that Srila Prabhupada really wanted this part of his mission develop. He said, he said in 1977, just a few months before he left, he said, 50% of my mission is incomplete. We haven't established these farm communities, far Vanashram Dharma. So he gave that, that direction to the society to please work on this and develop it. This is the future of our movement. This is the future of the world. And um, he wanted that done in a, in a, in a worldwide way amongst the, the different temples, communities around the world. He said for every temple, there should be a farm community. Uh, and that farm community would supply all of the needs for the temple and also a place for, especially for families, grihastas, to live, raise children in a more, of a more natural environment. Um, and of course, a lot of emphasis on keeping cows, protecting cows, and using cows also. So um, I was inspired by the whole idea that this is important part of bringing Krishna consciousness forward in the world in a, in a practical way, in a way that it will allow the devotees to be less encumbered by the arrangements made by the secular society for our livelihood. And it goes along with Srila Prabhupada's idea of simple living, high thinking, like that. It's a small book, it's about a hundred pages, and that's also available. <laughs> Through, you can also contact me, or there's one devotee here in Mayapur, her name is Sri Devi. She lives in Jalangi Dam, and she has a large supply of my books. So, um, and she's making them available to anyone, like that. Maharaj, could you tell us something more about IPM, ISKCON Prison Ministry, when it started, what was it like in the early days? Yeah, um, well, it started back in the late 1980s, beginning of 1990s. Um, I was living in the New Vrindavan community, and uh, we had some situations where one of our members was put in jail. <laughs> in the local jail near New Vrindavan. And so uh, we would go as a group to visit him and um, we would hold programs in the jail. And so I started to see, based on that experience of this one devotee being in jail, this, was, this would be a good form of preaching. So I thought, oh, I should maybe see what I can do. And I did a little research and I found that when one devotee had already started prison preaching, his name was, um, I'm bad with names. Is that Chandrasekhar? Chandrasekhar Prabhu, mm -hmm. yeah, from America. He, uh, he actually wrote, wrote letters to as many jails as he could to see if he could get Srila Prabhupada's books in jails. Um, the response was very small but there was some beginning. So I had connected with him and he was interested in working, we were working together to try to um, see how we could get Prabhupada's books in jails. That was the main force. And uh, we had gotten some, some success going through the library systems in the jails and also through certain favorable chaplains uh, who were, you know, officiating the religious uh, activities within the jails. And then gradually, gradually, I started to find out that there were actually people who were interested in our movement in jail. Some were actually devotees who had been put in jail for whatever reason. And then I started to connect with them. And my first experience with jails was to arrange visitation 
to go and meet the mm. inmates and just sit there, talk with them and f give them a little bit of uh, connection with Krishna consciousness in that way. Mm. And that's how it all started. And then one thing led to another and then uh, books came in. And the books, when the books started to come in more and more in different places, that's when people became more interested in our movement inside of the jails. And then those who, who became interested wanted to practice. And based on their desire to practice, they would petition the, the organization, the, the administration in the prisons, that we also want rights to practice our religion. And that wasn't always so easy because many of the persons who were in charge of the religious organizations in jail were somewhat biased against our movement and not aware of who we were actually was. We were deemed as some small cult that is trying to do something. But we did have some success and because of that and gradually, gradually books started to go in and then a writing campaign started to develop and Chandra Shekhar was writing <coughs> at least 20 inmates per day <coughs> and then he was giving me many of the same contacts and I also started to write and so it all mm. started through letter writing and trying to get Prabhupada's books. What was it like the first time you walked in jail and those big steel doors closed behind you? It's, it was quite unnerving <laughs> <laughs> because it was like entering into some kind of lower planet. Mm. <laughs> it seemed like it. And uh, there was always so much, uh, you know, bureaucracy, security, going through different, just like um, I was, I did a, we did a jail program in Liverpool, England, about three weeks ago, just before I came to, I was in right, right, right at the end of February. And I couldn't believe how many doors we had to unlock to get to the inmates and mm -hmm. there was this lady who was the <coughs> jail keeper she had this big chain of keys and you know, it was like heavy weight of keys and she was moving us from one un one locked place to another and finally we got to the where we were supposed to go it must have been about 10 doors <laughs> so yeah it, it there's there's many places that uh, they, you might call it security, but it's just just so much bureaucracy. <laughs> so aside from the administration not being very favorable toward Krishna consciousness, what other obstacles do we face for preaching in jails? Um, well, one of the, it's interesting because a inmate audience, we did have some success in organizing programs within the jails. And it's rare that you find that the inmates who attend the program, some jails, for instance, we are preaching in Croatia, we did many jails there, also Slovenian and the UK, United States was a lot different. The security and the restrictions are very, very big. But when the inmates would come to a, an organized program that we got sanctioned by the administration, many of them were somewhat, what we say, challenging. When, I mean, challenge would be a kind of like a small word. <laughs> You know, when you, the idea is like when you give a class to the devotees, all the devotees are on your side. They want to hear something good. They, they're rooting for you, you know. Not the inmate audience. It's like that. They want to see what you got. They want to pick out things you say, and then they want to somehow challenge you or give their own opinion based on what you say. So a lot of times you get into some kind of polemics or some arguments. But somehow or other, if you're somewhat humble <laughs> and they see your sincere things somehow move on. Just like when I was in Liverpool three weeks ago, um, four of us came in mm -hmm. and we brought some books, we had some instruments and they let us in. And about 12 inmates came to the program. So as soon as I started to talk, they started to challenge me. <laughs> 
uh, you know, they, with their own ideas and say, well, you know, well, you say this, but I say this. So at one point, I couldn't say anything, I, every word that I was trying to say. And then I said, okay, well, you don't want to hear me talk, so I'll keep quiet. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. But then there was one really big kind of leadership guy who was amongst them, and he started yelling at the other guys, let him talk, you know. <laughs> he came to talk, <laughs> and he shut everybody else up, and so I was able to. So that's what it's like in jail. So, you know, you never know what to expect. <laughs> what about the inmates themselves, someone who actually takes an interest in Christian consciousness? What challenges do inmates face? What was that last said? What, what challenges do the inmates themselves face? Inside? Yeah, for someone who wants to practice Krishna consciousness. Well, they are allowed so much, depends on the particular prison rules, they are, they're allowed so much paraphernalia, so sometimes they can only have so many books. And a lot of times they see Japa bees as being a dangerous uh, weapon to oneself, and so they're not allowed to have japa beads because they can use it to strangle themselves or somebody else. So we try to give these little kind of like 27 beads on a thing like that, so that's how we were introducing it. So over the years, many times the, the inmates who wanted to practice were restricted in different ways limited amounts of books and as far as their sometimes there would be a three or four of them together they weren't allowed to meet regularly like other the other religious organizations mm -hmm. so there was some discrimination based on ignorance uh, so that was that was a challenge for many of them and sometimes they would come forward and uh, protest and things would change a little bit, but then sometimes when they would protest, the biggest problem was when someone would become really Krishna conscious and he'd start influencing others, they'd move him out of that jail and put him in another jail. Mm -hmm. So that way they would break the Sangha, they would break the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. What about diet? It must be hard. Diet, yeah, that's always been a problem. We actually went to court in one, in one jail in order to get a diet for a vegetarian diet as part of the regulated diet that would come in for the, the regulated prisoners. And we lost the case. <laughs> we tried, but the agencies that were food supply agencies to the jails were much more powerful and they made their point and they had uh, their arguments was that you know we were pushing out all of them and so somehow the the uh, judge ruled in their favor we couldn't get mm -hmm. in but there is one jail in California that's completely vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that goes back and it's mentioned in this book here in Holy Jail, you can read about it. Yeah, and it's uh, every, and they compare the uh, what we say the crime there's a lot of crime in jail. And especially drugs and many other forms of violence. That particular jail which is vegetarian uh, it's much less, <laughs> not much less, more than 50% less than other jails comparatively. Yeah. So, so that was, that's an interesting situation where by just practicing vegetarianism, people become less violent. <laughs> because many of the jails are, are quite difficult and you, to be an inmate depends on you know the type of jail. There are different levels of of restrictions. There is uh, maximum security, minimum security, and uh, what we say somewhere in between. There's county jails. There's federal jails. 
So many, each jail has its own pretty set of rules and regulations that they follow and restrictions they can give accordingly. So you don't find, you know, a, that's something that is across the board. You don't know what to expect when you go into different jails. <laughs> is there a uh, official GBC ministry for prison preaching? GBC ministry? Um, not officially, Congregational Development Ministry became very much interested in our, our uh, preaching. So they included us in their newsletter. So whatever write-ups that we were doing, they were also including that in their newsletters. Mm -hmm. So that's the support we got from Congregational Development Ministry here in, uh, in Mayapur. Mm -hmm. But there is no, there are many, devotees in different places around the world who are working in different jails to preach and to inspire. And that's, that's being done simply on a grassroots level. Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah. So there is no official ministry for ISKCON prison mm -hmm. ministry. Now, do you have initiated disciples in jails? Uh, there are some gurus who do. <laughs> I guess that answers your question in a negative way. <laughs> but somehow or other, I never took on disciples. And for whatever reason, I mean, there was a couple that wanted to become disciples, but uh, it didn't work out within the prison. So it's hard for them to practice the four regulative principles in the jails because the whole environment is really the opposite. Mm -hmm. The televisions and whatever else is available for entertainment, and you know, it just flies in the face of the four regulative principles. Mm. Well, the whole world is like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are many, there are some jails that are more, you, you can't say sattvic, but they're less tamic, tamasic, that's for sure. <laughs> What about book distribution? How is book distribution going? That's on? the main thing. Books are really the basis by which we spread Krishna consciousness. The, the inmates that are practicing, we try to send them, just like in uh, London, we got a nice group of devotees who are preaching there, and we send in like every Prabhupada book. And um, the libraries, in many of the jails, they want to get a variety of different topics in their libraries. So yeah. they're open to take our books and they put it in the, in the prison libraries. Mm -hmm. And that, that starts you know, people's interest in Krishna consciousness. Then they find out, oh, well, this is an actual organized religion and they want to find out more. And so using many of our books have the addresses of temples. And many of them write like that. So that's one way. Um, and then of course, there is one uh, very dedicated prison preacher in Florida, in Alachua. Her name is Bhakti Lata. And she's been doing it for more than 20 years, full time. She writes, she arranges for other devotees to write letters to send in to inmates because mm -hmm. then they develop this what they call a pen pal type of thing and then inmates will connect with a particular devotee and that devotee will try to cultivate that inmate in different ways and then um, she sends in books and she also has a newsletter we have an ISKCON prison ministry newsletter that comes out and, uh, uh, once every two months. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that newsletter. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's a very, and, and there are people who help support the newsletter. She, she raises funds. So there is a lot of ad hoc support that comes from different areas around the world. Yeah, her book distribution numbers are pretty good too, as I remember. Yeah, yeah. She distributes a lot of books in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but in London, we were, we were really successful just before the lockdown came because of the coronavirus. We were, I was doing prison preaching practically once a week for weeks on end in London. And then all of a sudden, of course, 
when the lockdown came and everything stopped. Mm. But London is going good. We have two, and both of them are ladies. They're working very hard to put Prabhupada's books in jails. And there's one, uh, Radha Dasi, she's getting all of Prabhupada's books into institutions all over the UK, schools, care homes, libraries, hospitals, um, and of course, in prisons also. Mm -hmm. So that's a mass book distribution program, of just flooding the area with books. So the in inmates that receive Prabhupada's books get pretty inspired? That's how we really connect with people. The chanting comes later, when, but the books are the first thing. It's really Srila Prabhupada's books that really mm -hmm. attract people to Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. When they read the books and they, they get in a nice experience, uh, they they write and I you know we're really I'm really interested in what your your books say. Please send more books. I got one book. Can you have any? Do you have, do you have any more books? Mm. So it's the books really that are doing the preaching. <laughs> they get uh, back to Godhead magazine also. Yeah, the Bhakti Lata runs a subscription with the inmates also, mm -hmm. and it's all funded by devotees who. Donate. <laughs> now, if a devotee wanted to get involved in prison preaching, how would they do that? Well, every once in a while someone comes up to me and asks me. <laughs> I usually send them the Bhakti Lata and she aligns them with some inmate who, who they could write to to start off. If you're really bold, then you can make an effort to try to get into a jail and go through the administration red tape. And yeah, as a visitor. Huh? Get into the jail as a visitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you know about that. <laughs> he also does prison preaching. Yeah, he's, he's, he's quite good. He has a whole set of inmates that are, he preaches to. <laughs> Actually, at one time I was in five different jails. Three in North Carolina and two in Virginia. Uh -huh. So it is definitely an amazing experience the first time you walk in and those big steel doors clang and you think, my God, thankful I'm just visiting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, whew. It's like, yeah, it's a lower planet. <laughs> now, we, can't we make an analogy also? Because this material world is a prison and in prison they, they have to follow their, they have to observe their sentence when they get out in halfway house, there's a, per, there's a parole officer. Right. So there's an exact analogy to our situation with Guru yeah, on the and very, following principles. Very, on the very back of the book, we have a statement by Srila Prabhupada that kind of highlights that point. Mm. What are the shackles of this prison life? I do not know what the case is here of prison life, but what I have seen in New Delhi when I was invited to give some good lessons to the prisoners. This is Prabhupada. Prabhupada did some prison preaching. I have seen so many prisoners in shackles, iron chains. And then he goes on, we are also chained up here. That is our sense enjoyment. We are chained up in this material world by sense enjoyment. That's all. If you want to cut your prison life, then you, your first sy 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 symptom will to be minimize your sense enjoyment or to regulate your sense enjoyment. So that's mm. Srila Prabhupada's statement. I remember one devotee, he, uh, His Holiness, uh, Bhir Krishna Maharaj initiated him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he went, he, he got out on parole and he was supposed to report to his parole officer. Mm -hmm. but this, and they gave him a job, they gave him a car, but the stipulation was he had to stay at the halfway house. Mm. But he decided, I have a car, I have gas in it, I'm going to Mexico. Mm -hmm. So they caught him at the border and he went back into jail. Yeah. That's an example of how the material world works. <laughs> to make it a broader, we can understand that, you know, everyone wants to live forever, but we can't. So there's, a, there's one of the restrictions of this material world. Everyone wants to be happy, but there are so many sources of misery that are imposed upon us. Now that's another form of, what we say, shackles. Or, mm. 
Everyone wants to fulfill their desires, but it's not always possible. So we see, if you look around, <clears throat> that in every area of life, restriction is always there, and that's, that's built into this material world. So, of course, there is a place beyond this material world where none of these restrictions are there, and one can live eternally and, and fulfill all the desires for knowledge, for happiness, and ultimate for the, the perfect relationship with Krishna. So we could liken the instructions of the plural officer to the instructions of one spiritual master. <laughs> yeah, that would be a nice analogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Spiritual, spiritual master is the mercy manifestation of Krishna who has come to get us out of this jail. <laughs> Do you have any uh, personal stories you'd like to share with us about in, in, experiences with in, uh, incarcerated devotees? Boy, I have so many. <laughs> I'm trying to think which one would be the one that would be interesting. Tell, tell we have some time, Lauren. Yeah, I have... Uh, well, um, I'll start with a short one, then I'll get into a more lengthy ones. During the coronavirus, there was one inmate who had just connected with us for a few months before then. So he was chanting, he was reading our books, and he was writing some of our devotees who were preaching to him. And then the, the, the jail itself, many of the inmates came down with the coronavirus. And so, but the prison administration did nothing. They did nothing to help these inmates. They just let them go. Because, you know, it's good business to reduce the population. <laughs> so it makes it easier for them to manage the jails. So they didn't do anything. So here, there's this one devotee. So he had some faith in the holy name. So, and he, he came down with coronavirus in a very severe way. He had all the symptoms. So he decided, I'm, well, if I'm going to die, I'm just going to chant. So he just went into his prison, his cell, and prayed and chanted. That's all he did. And he prayed and prayed and chanted and chanted continuously. After one week, he was completely cured. <laughs> no medicine, no care, nothing. He wrote a letter. And I received that letter. So he had full faith in the holy name and Krishna, and Krishna saved him. And Nechio Shodi Maya, Nashi the medicine of the holy name. Yeah, Nasi Bhadalagi. <laughs> nice story. It? Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the medicine in this age, the chanting of the holy name. So that's a, that's a real testimony of faith. <laughs> Of course, his faith was forced into that, and he had no alternative just to turn to Krishna and chant, and he did it. And uh, Krishna did something. <laughs> so tell us more. I can tell you a story about the jail you introduced me into. Petersburg. Oh, Columbia. Mm, South Carolina. West, uh, no, in Virginia. Petersburg. Petersburg, Virginia. Yeah. So uh, Sarvadrik Prabhu connected me with a group that he was preaching. And then I had come a couple times after that. So one time I went into one, that same prison and it was, it was a really rainy day. It was pouring rain. I remember the day, October 16, 2019. And I came and uh, uh, they were expecting me. I was supposed to give a Bhagavad Gita class to the group that he had started, and it was about nine devotees, nine members, and there was one young man who was initiated by Sarva. His name was Krishna Kirtan. Yeah. Right. And so he was the leader of the group, and I was supposed to meet this group and speak to them. So I came, and then the chaplain came out, and Mr. Houston. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Houston. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he came out, and I'm sitting in the waiting room, and he, he shakes my hand, and he says, thank you for coming, you know. Um, just wait here, and I'm going to arrange everything. So then he comes back out, and then 
I had forgotten my ID. I had no ID on it. And you just don't get in if you don't have an ID. Yeah. I had no ID. And so, and then he, he escorts me past the security without checking to see if I had an ID or not. So I'm thinking, hey, Krishna's working, all right. <laughs> so <laughs> I got in. And then he says, wait here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the arrangements for you to meet the inmates. So I did. And then after a few minutes, he comes back. He said, oh, yes, so we need to see your ID. And I was praying to Krishna, thank you for getting me in. Please don't <laughs> let them find out that I don't have an idea, ID. And all of a sudden, he comes out and says, where's your ID? And I said, oh. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't say that I didn't know you should have an ID, but I did. I said, well, I really didn't know I was supposed to bring one. <laughs> I kind of made up that story. He said, all right, wait here. And so he went to see the, the head jailer. What did they call him? The person is in jail. Warden. The warden, yeah. Now, the warden's never there. That's what he was told me. But he happened to be in that day, just happened to be there that day. So he went and he talked to the warden and he convinced the warden to let me in without the ID. Wow. So and I came back and I said, thank you, Krishna. And then I came and then he was escorting me to where the inmates went. And the inmates came out one at a time and they all paid full obeisances as I was walking in, one after another. And then I sat there and they started asking me questions and we had kirtan and I started talking a little bit about preaching in America and Krishna consciousness and then the program was so successful mm -hmm. that everybody was asking nice questions and uh, uh, everyone seemed to be satisfied and we took a big group picture at mm -hmm. the end and, and then and when I was over he escorted me back and he said, next time, you know, bring your ID. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was a miracle because you just don't get in. If you don't have it, they don't want to hear any excuses. But somehow, by the, by the mercy of the Lord, he inspired that warden to let me in. I think you charmed him, Maharaj. Historically, this particular individual has been antagonistic towards the devotees. Oh, yeah. You simply charmed him. <laughs> I don't know if I charmed him, but I didn't do much. I just sat there <laughs> like this, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a very successful program we had that day. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many other stories. Uh, I mean, I can go through the list. We're preaching in one country around the world that we're not allowed to preach in as a society. It's in the Eastern, Eastern Bloc. Mm -hmm in the Asian bloc, and uh, one devotee became a, well, a chaplain. He became the Hindu chaplain in the jail to administrate to anyone who wants uh, some advice on any kind of, we might say, Hindu-connected mm, religious practice. So one day he went to the administration and said, do you have any, anybody who's interested in our, you know, our Hindu faith? He said, yeah, they have one, we have one man, he's on death row. We'll send him to your program, because we were, they were just given Bhagavad Gita classes. So the young man came, and he, he had about a month left before they were going to execute him. He was charged with I don't know, I can't remember the crime, but he was, going, he was capital punishment. So he started coming to the class, and he, he was always complaining that he didn't do the crime, and he was being, you know, put in that situation. And when his parents would come, he would complain to them that, you know, he didn't do it, and he's being, you know, falsely accused. But after coming to our classes for some time, and reading the Bhagavad Gita, he got really interested. And he kept the Bhagavad Gita with him all the time, and he was reading it, and he'd come back, and he'd talk to us about it when we have the meetings. And then he completely changed. He said, yes, I did commit the crime. <laughs> he became a little humble, and then he started talking. And then it was time, after some time, that he 
was meant to meet his execution. So they were taking him as to his execution. And he said to the, the jailers, he said, can I keep a Bhagavad Gita with me when you, when you execute me? Because in my next life, I want to be a devotee. Wow. So they Amazing. said, they said, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're, and they were walking him along and he was waving to his fellow ailments, inmates as he was passing by. I'm going to be a devotee of Krishna in my next life. And <laughs> he was waving goodbye. Oh, amazing story. <laughs> and of course, after that, the jailers came back and said to our devotees, that the chaplain, what did you do to him? <laughs> <laughs> we have to drag these persons. They never go voluntarily. But he was just walking along and following mm. them. So he became so absorbed in the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita that he understood, yeah, I'm not this body. And I have another life coming up and that life is gonna be, I'm gonna be a devotee. So that was an amazing story. Wonderful. Yeah. Tell us more, Maharaj. More, more stories of inmates? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Mm. Let me think of. Yeah, there's one devotee. He's actually practicing very seriously. He was a Christian. His name was uh, Matthews. What was his first name? Uh, Jason. Jason Matthews, yeah. And so when he was five years old, he was in Germany in one airport in Germany and the devotees were doing Harinam in the airport and he was he saw the, the the Harinam and he was only a little baby like five years old he broke away from his parents start chasing the Harinam <laughs> hmm. and then his parents brought him back and then he grew up very a very strict religious family they were Christians so he was learning the Bible and he was, uh, you know, also preaching the Bible to his friends. He was really a very devout Christian. But somehow or other, without getting into all the details, he got involved with a self-defense situation where he was being harassed by a, a, a police officer who was about to rape his wife, so he killed the police officer. And to save his wife from being attacked by the police officer. So then he was put in jail. And then he was trying to practice his Christianity in jail, but after some time, he lost his enthusiasm and he became somewhat victimized by the jail environment and started getting into wrong activities. And then at one point, he felt so depressed and despondent that he thought, what's the use of me living anymore? So he had decided, it. he writes about this, he, he decided to commit suicide. And so, and just before that, just before he was going to commit suicide, one of the fellow inmates in the jail he was gave him a book coming back, Prabhupada's book, about reincarnation. And he read it from cover to cover, and he said, wow, this is what I've been looking for. And so he became so infatuated and enthused by the book, and then he looked in the back and he saw there was a list of temples that were, and then he contacted the temples, and then finally he came to the devotees, and then he started writing the devotees. And he told his whole story, and in both these books I tell his story. In the first one, I edited it, because there are certain things in there that I thought wouldn't be palatable to a general audience. But then when I did the second book, I told this story again without the editing. <laughs> so you can read about it if you get a copy of this book. And he writes about his experience in Krishna Kasa. He became so enthusiastic 
that he was just preaching to as many inmates as he could, but he was getting also much, much restrictions because of his preaching. And also some, some of the inmates didn't like his preaching, so he was also harassed in that way too. But he continued, and now he's still in prison in South Carolina. And his preaching is going on even better now. He's got a whole group that he meets with and like that, so. He's a brilliant man. Huh? He's a brilliant man. Really brilliant, yeah. He, he's like a, he's like a priest. <laughs> hmm. Knows the Bible backwards and forwards. Yeah. No Bhagavad Gita backwards and forwards. Yeah. Yeah, and his whole material life collapsed around him. And in so many ways he tried to get out of prison, but because that police officer was somewhat connected to some big official in the government, uh, they're restricting any chances that he can get out of jail. They're making it difficult. His wife was the person who brought the gun into the police office. Yeah. And she got off scot-free because her father was a police officer. Yeah, his wife had the gun. She gave it to him when she was attacked by the police officer like that. And she was, uh, she was the daughter of a police officer, yes. too. <laughs> she walked. Yeah, so it's, it's quite wild out there. <laughs> and he was charged with first-degree murder. It was not first. First-degree murder means I decide I'm going to kill that person premeditated. Right. It was manslaughter, self-defense. It was self-defense, but he's been trying through different agencies, lawyers and others, no success. So. They don't want to hear his case at all. So. But he's taken advantage of it by preaching Krishna consciousness in jail. Mm -hmm. Chance, I think he chants 32 rounds a day, he reads the book, and he writes. He's also a very good writer. He writes essays. So I have a, there's a whole collection of his essays that I keep mm -hmm. on different topics on, on Krishna consciousness. So you meet some really dedicated persons there's another story which I find really interesting. This was a person who was put in jail in America in California. He was a, he killed eight people. <laughs> and he was a member of a gang, different gangs. In America they have, in many of the big cities there's many gangs and the gangs they fight with each other and, and they also have, you know, automatic rifles and it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's a highly armed country. So he was put in jail. And then uh, he first connected with Vaisheshika Prabhu. And Vaisheshika was writing, and then somehow I found out about him. So then we were, we were both writing him. Then I sent him a Chaitanya Charitamri, did the full book on Lord Chaitanya's pastimes and life. And he really got absorbed in, in the reading, and he was reading it day and night. And he was writing to me, explaining how much he's really attracted to Lord Nityananda. <laughs> <laughs> Chai And then at one point, Vaisheshika came in jail. He got in jail and gave him an initiation in the jail. And the initiation was very simple. Put the Bhagavad Gita down there, you put your hand on the Bhagavad Gita, and and you agree to chant 16 rounds and follow four regular principles, and you're initiated. <laughs> There's no, you can't do a fire yagya in a jail. <laughs> so yeah, so he got initiated, and he was, his, name, his name was Balavan Vid, Vidva, um, Balavan, Balavan Vidvan, something like that. Uh, Balavan, Balavan Nittai, yeah, Nittai. So he wrote me one day in a very incredulous letter he wrote. It was interesting. He said, you know, he's tough. I mean, he's I a mean, really powerful guy. So he was out in the yard. They have this thing where they go out and they do their exercises and they can walk around. They have a little bit of freedom. So he was out there and the inmates kind of associate with each other. And so one inmate came up to him and said, his name was Ben Baker. That was his actual name. He said, Is you, are your name Ben Baker? He said, yeah. He said, well, you killed my best friend. And then he attacked him. He attacked Ben. 
And then, but Ben, you know, who was the Balaban Nittai, he didn't, he said, he said, usually when that would happen, I would just destroy the guy. <laughs> but I didn't. I just grabbed him, I held him down until the jailers came and they took him away. He said, I surprised myself. <laughs> he said, it must be due to Lord Nityananda's mercy. <laughs> And he wrote a whole long letter explaining how he would never do that. You know, if somebody was going to attack him, he was going to, you know, finish him off. But he didn't. <laughs> he became gentle. <laughs> and so he understood this is the power of Lord Nityananda's mercy. Hmm. So that was, an, that was an interesting experience he had. So uh, these are, I mean, these how are how Prabhupada's books are actually transferring the lives of people in jail. The books are really the main preachers, and so we somehow or other just have to get those books in there. Of course, every once in a while, if we're fortunate, we can organize programs in some jails. But that's also difficult. But we've had luck in countries like Croatia. We can get into jails very easy there. They allow us in Slovenia. It's kind of open. They welcome us in. The administration is happy. They, they put pictures of us in the jail saying, these people are coming, come to the classes, hmm. like that. Not in America, though. It's no, not, opposite in America. It's completely opposite. They don't want you in. If they have to let you in by some legal rule, hmm. then they let you in. But. And in Croatia, we got in every jail in Croatia, we got the whole set of Srila Prabhupada's books in every jail there. So that was fortunate. We, had, we, had, we got some connection with someone who was a politician who liked what we were doing and he used his influence to allow us to get Prabhupada's books in, every, in all the jails. And the books are the amazing things. Uh, they, they just transform the lives of these inmates. Any devotees have any questions you'd like to ask Maharaj? Such an Orion? Yeah. Speak up, Prabhu, so everyone can hear. Loudly. California. Is that including? Is that including what? What was that word? Oh, as far oh that one prison yeah. <laughs> I can't honestly answer that. <laughs> I would think not. That's the way I would think, but I can't say for sure. <laughs> it's not done by the devotees. Somehow it came from the inside. And they actually thought that this was a way to reduce the problems, to make everyone vegetarian. <laughs> and it worked, at least on that level, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it's going on, and there are many devotees in different places around the world who have their own programs and regular inmates that they're connecting with. I would say there's at least a few thousand inmates around the world who are actually chanting regularly, reading Prabhupada's books, like that. When they get out, it's a, it becomes a problem. Because <laughs> one of the mindsets of the inmates is that they're al they always want to make up for lost time when they get out because they're always thinking, you know, I'm missing out on life. And so, so sometimes they actually continue with their Krishna consciousness and other times they marginalize it and go back to material life again. So the best thing is to stay and keep them in jail. They become good devotees there. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, we don't wish it like that, but it's the fact. 
Anyone else? Any question you'd like to ask me? Mataji? Speak very loudly, please. Yes, give the mic. Mm. Okay. okay. It's okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanal Pranam. Uh, I read a book called Salted Bread. Salted bread, wow, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a very heart-wrenching story of the two uh, friends. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask, have you ever preached in Russian jails? And uh, if not, uh, are all the inmates of, inmates of the jail who practice Krishna consciousness are troubled so much? I have never practiced preaching in Russia. In fact, I've never been to Russia. <laughs> <coughs> and what was the, right, the next second part of your question? Are the inmates of the jail troubled so much for practicing Krishna consciousness? Are they troubled? It, it, to be to honest, to answer your honest answer honestly, it's usually up to the administration in the jail. Some are lenient, some are more strict, some are just don't like our movement. Some think our movement's very good and it's helping. We get letters from, <coughs> excuse me, from uh, chaplains saying, please give us more of your books and whatever else you had because it's helping our, our inmate population to become more, more God conscious. So it depends really. The jails are somewhat independent on how they manage their affairs. So you. And usually it's by the personnel in the jail. If you get a person who's just like against everything, then you run into so many problems. The inmates have so many problems. And there's one devotee, and he works in a jail in Oregon, and uh, he is a counselor in jail. It's Idaho, I thought. Huh? Hmm? Not Idaho? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Idaho, right? It's in Boise, Idaho. Well, no, the jail is in Oregon, but he lives in Boise, Idaho, oh, okay. yeah. The jail is in Oregon. He crosses the border to go to work. Um, yeah, and uh, so he's been, st he's been doing prison preaching there. And because of his, his position, he uses his influence to really push Krishna consciousness forward. So it's like that. It's, it's who you know, who's running the place, like that. Have you ever been troubled by any of the jail? Huh? Have you been troubled? Have, have, have you ever been troubled by the warden or someone by the end of the jail? Like something have like I ever been troubled once I get in, inside the jail? No, before entering the jail. Like sometimes they don't want uh, people to preach. Like by the administration. Oh yeah, they find ways not to let you in. <laughs> that happens a lot. Um, depends again on the on the jail. Um, yeah, just like one time, we went into one jail. It was also called Petersburg, but it was in the UK. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to take my fingerprint. They needed fingerprints before I could go in, but the machine wouldn't pick up my fingerprint. <laughs> so they say, we can't get your fingerprint. I say, well, I was thinking, I didn't say this, I was thinking, when you become a devotee, you lose your material identity. You know? <laughs> <laughs> a liberated soul. <laughs> That happened to Krishna Shetra Maharaj also. <laughs> they, they couldn't, they were pushing that machine and no fingerprint was coming out. <laughs> and they were wondering, what's wrong with the machine? But anybody, everybody else, their fingerprint was. So I had, a, I had problems at that time. But somehow or other, I got in. <laughs> that, was, that was fortunate. So, because you... Many times you find someone who works in the jail who really wants us to come in and they use their influence for the administration to make it easier for us to get in and they facilitate us. And that happens a lot in different places, especially in the UK. We had good, good luck there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So you might say each jail is pretty much unique, independent, different. Is there anyone preaching in Russian jails? Because there are like books. In Russian jails? No. Um, I'm not aware of it. But I haven't heard any. Uh, I, at least I haven't heard anything. There may be. There probably are. It's not something that's broadcast so often. Those who are actually doing jail preaching simply don't make it public so much. <laughs> for, for whatever reason, there are a lot of individual devotees who have gotten together in groups and have started some jail preaching, especially in America. That's there. So yeah, it's, it's not, it's, ISKCON prison ministry is not organized. It's just a group of different people who are trying to get into jail and preach Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Thank and you. Bhakti Lanta is completely overworked. Completely? Overworked. She's overworked, She's yeah. She's anybody who wants to get involved, um, I can connect you with her. She's quite good. She'll Amazing be a, devotee. Yeah, she's really, she's dedicated her life to it and um, very compassionate. Because the, uh, these persons who are in jail, pretty much mm, they don't get much connection with the outside world. Even sometimes their family members, friends and others, after some time they, they, they lose contact with them. So if they get a letter from someone, they feel so happy. So just by our connecting with them, it gives them some happiness. Mm -hmm. They feel like, you know, somebody cares. Mm -hmm. And we do care. But, you know, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of them feel completely neglected mm -hmm. by others. So it's good. It's nice, mm -hmm. nice way to keep them happy. Because, you know, if they, if they, they appreciate all well, the devotees are so kind, then they become more interested and practicing like that. Other questions? Prabhuji, yeah. can you pass the mic? Hello, Thank you for a very enlightening class. So I wanted to ask this, uh, how you can uh, connect this uh, prison to our regular material life? situations because this is also one prison where here yeah. yeah. we always compare this same prison to uh, our regular or this material world. So yeah. how will you come up and write to us on that? Yeah, I'll read you something as soon as I can find it here. Let me see. Which I haven't seen this book in a while so I have to find out where it is. Mm -hmm. This jail, this first book is really stocked with so many. Mm -hmm. Who published this book, Maharaj? It's beautifully done. Uh, um, the cover was designed by a devotee here in Mayapur named uh, Vaikuntha Nittai. Maybe you know him. Mm -hmm. And this book was published by one publishing company in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. This one we did somewhere else. But it was done through uh, Congregational Prison Ministry. Let me see here if I can find this little... This answers your particular question in a very interesting way. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. I haven't gone through this in a while, so I'm not sh exactly sure where this particular thing is. But the analogy is there in all aspects because prison means restriction and material life means restriction. Prison life means forced uh, difficulties, sufferings, restrictions. The same thing with, with, with uh, material, with prison life, it's the same thing. So, 
This is really cute if I can find it. <laughs> I'm not sure where it is. So, I mean, you, all you do have to read is read Prabhupada's books and he, and he makes the analogy that, yeah, we want to be free, but we can't. We want to live forever, we can't. We want to fulfill our desires completely for happiness and there's always problems. Suffering comes up, difficulties come up. So many, uh, what we say, outside influences are always there in trying to live in this material world. It's a jail. There's no difference. And this is one of the main things that we, we tell the inmates that you're locked in this particular prison, but you can be free. Don't think your freedom means to get out of this, these four walls called a prison. Your freedom is coming from your consciousness. You can free your consciousness and by becoming, developing that consciousness that is free and that is Krishna consciousness. That consciousness that is above the restrictions of the material energy. So we preach like that and they listen that you can find freedom even while in jail. And this is, this, is, this is the subtitle of the book, it's called Freedom Within Captivity. So in that sense, it also applies for us that we're captivated by this restrictive life of, of living in this material body and having to you know, exp experience the miseries of the material world in different ways. I wish I could find this. It's really good. <laughs> I can't find it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't seen this book in a while. <laughs> but it's... Um, it's interesting because there are so many interesting stories about how people have changed their lives tr drastically simply by practicing Krishna consciousness in jail. And I can actually say some of them are, are really actually happy. And some, uh, we get letters from inmates saying, boy, it wasn't, if, I, if I didn't go to jail, I would have never met the devotees. I would have <laughs> never been a, a devotee of Krishna. They actually could consider that their good fortune. Yeah, so these are, these are things, yeah. Krishna says in Gita, Daiviyesha gunamaye mamamaya duraktyaya. Yeah. Mamilaye prabhadente mayamitam. What is maya? Durga. Durga means a fort. How to get out of the fort? We're locked up by the modes of material nature. And unless we surrender, we can't get out. And that's in jail or out of jail. Yeah, it's just, it's, it, the analogy is perfect and the, and the points of the analogy actually fit perfectly. The material world is yeah, a place of restriction and limitation. And Krishna consciousness breaks that out, takes one above that and one can actually experience freedom and happiness. I don't know where this little thing I wanted to read is. I know it's in here somewhere. Maybe it's at the end of the book. <laughs> I'm looking at the front. And, you know, there's a lot of letters from the chaplains. There's pictures here of devotees who are involved in prison preaching. Uh, this book is really quite good. We actually are trying to translate it. I think we actually did into Hindi so we can distribute it throughout India also, like that. Maybe you could show up, uh, hold up some of the artwork, Maharaj. You want to see? Some of, the some of the inmates are very talented artists also. Yeah, I don't know if you'll be able to see it from where you're sitting, but 
Uh, we got some the artwork. There's one artist. He is amazing. Really amazing artist. Let me see. I don't know. This is a picture of Lord Chaitanya here. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> Um, but there are some better pictures, really, in this one, I think, there is, where do you see these pictures? This is unbelievable. Take a look at that. <laughs> Perfect. It's like, looks like in, a devotee artist did it. So, f I mean, first class artwork <laughs> so you get like that maybe I put this in this book this little thing anyway the second book is more like a follow up for the first one and there's there's a lot of comparison in there between the material world and prisons. So yeah, I can't find that little thing that I wanted to read. It's really interesting. I would answer your question like that. Venkatesh Prabhu, you had a question? I didn't. This one centers completely on the inmates. And this one is broader, gives a lot of philosophy, also gives accounts of different preaching programs, talks about the devotees who are involved in preaching program. We give their bio also, their bi um, uh, nice stories. This is more like a broader one, the first one. And the second one is the inmates, their artwork, their letters, their glorifications of Prabhupada, poetry, their realizations, how they came to meet Krishna consciousness when they got in jail. So it's about, this one's about them. This one is called Forbidden Voices. And this, this cover was also done by uh, by Kunta Nittai. Mm -hmm. very, he's been very helpful in designing these books. Yeah. Uh, another question, Maharaj. Uh, uh, what do you see as differences between prisoners in various countries? What do I see difference between? Prisoners in various countries. Uh, you were saying about USA and UK at least. That may be more. Some Jails are like picnics, you know, it's, it's not, you, you wonder, it, is this actually a jail? <laughs> I've seen places like in Slovenia, there was one jail where they go home on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and then they come back, you know, on the weekdays, and so they're part-time inmates. <laughs> yeah. Of course, their crimes are not so serious, but yeah, it's like that. Uh, yeah, there's there's a pretty broad dichotomy between the environments between jails, some of them, and the biggest problem in in prisons is that there is a whole drug culture, especially in the American prisons. And so the, the jailers or the guards, they bring in the drugs and they sell it to the inmates. So they're the ones that actually are fostering the, the drug culture inside is the, is the jailers. Because the inmates, they get money from different sources and then they buy drugs inside. So then, then that keeps crime going on and inside and there's always problems because of drugs. Drugs are, 
drugs probably land people in jail more than anything because of wanting drugs. There are so many murders, there are so many thieveries, there are so many different kinds of crimes. It's all centers around drugs. Drugs are the, the cause of a lot of crime. <laughs> One more question. <laughs> Over the period of years, uh, what do you see uh, as a change in uh, the nature of the crime and number of crimes? What is the question again? Over the years, what do you see as a difference in uh, the nature of the crime and of well, <clears throat> I don't have, you know, all of the statistics, but, and jails are organized around that. They have what is called maximum security, where these are, they're hardcore murderers that are in those. And then you have minimum security where there's, and the crimes are less, and usually robbery or some kind of, you know, Mostly robberies like that. So, yeah. But my experience is that many of them, they just really appreciate the devotees, some of them. Of course, once they get, they have to get to know you first and to get to trust you. Once they do, then they really open up. At the beginning, they're very suspicious, they're very much testing us by challenging us in different ways. So it's, it's an interesting form of preaching. Captive audience. Yeah. The idea is just <laughs> to get them to read Prabhupada's books and chant. Even if they stay in jail, at least they become a devotee there. And that's the main thing. Since the crime rates are increasing, I think prison preaching will also increase in the coming years. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, a, it's not good news, but anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like that. Well, most people who commit crimes don't go to jail. It's just those who get caught. <laughs> Actually, statistically, 25% of the world incarcerated population is in America. 25% yeah. of the entire jail population is in one country, mm. America. Yeah. Yeah, there's some, that we also publish those statistics too. And it's something like 2% of the population of America, when this book was written, were in jail. So 2% and at that time it was 300 million. 2% um, of 300 million is, I don't know, how much, 6 million. Jail, and on another level, jails are a big business too. It's a big business. Okay, so, and if you, any of you get, get involved in a little problem, just call me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send you some books. <laughs> Ho hopefully we don't have to do that, but, <laughs> yeah. So, so we'd like to thank Chandramali Maharaj for spending his time with us, giving us some words of wisdom. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. And those who are interested, you can contact me and or Congregational Development Ministry here in, in Mayapur and get a copy of these, these the, books. These books are in the Namhatta bookstore also. I know the uh, Holy Jail book is there. Thank you. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> teacher, a science teacher at uh, Shri Mayapur International School. Oh.
Nice. Very highly educated, intelligent guys. Science, huh? Doing wonderful service here. Physics.